Um, also, these programs really give you a lot of information uh, about our featured writer, Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and the history and mission of the Writer's Voice. Now it's the Writer's Voice that has the cafe and has writing workshops, and hopefully soon a uh, first annual Provincetown Writers Festival 2018. So we're excited about that. But, um, and it tells about upcoming uh, Writer's Voice. By the way, we are, the Writer's Voice Cafe is a part of the book festival. They asked us to be a part of it. And so, uh, 2 to 3.30, Yvonne D'Souza, who wrote Mad, MS Madness, about mul having multiple sclerosis, a giggle less, a laugh more. So she's going to read. She's also going to talk about um, self-publishing. And she's going to talk about, um, and also a Q&A. So you're welcome to come. It's 2 to 3.30, and we will have snacks again. So that's good. <laughs> um, all right. OK. Let's see. Well, this is a curious night. We need to have someone at the, I think it's only a matter of turning it on. But I would like to. Um, we have Matt on camera. We have the women at PTV are very much a part of um, our filming. And thanks to the staff, the Providence on Public Library also. And now we're going to go into the second part. We're looking forward to it. Reverend Kate Wilkinson will read from a favorite sermon, Whale Watching, and share some of her sources of inspiration. She will also follow with a Q&A. So be thinking of things that you might want to ask her. So without further ado, Reverend Kate. I'm going to turn this on. Oh. Guess what? We've been recording all along. <laughs> no problem. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for coming out. So I do consider myself a writer, and sometimes my old writers group in Boston says, but what have you been writing? And I say, 15 pages a week for my sermons. And that is mostly what I write these days. And I begin my worship services by reading a reading by someone else from all different sources. So I'd like to begin tonight by reading um, a reading called In the Beginning by one of my favorite writers, Nancy Schaefer. And the Kate in this story is not me. <laughs> Kate is teaching the kids about dinosaur air. That air you breathe, that air you have inside you every time you take a breath, that's dinosaur air, she says. <laughs> Dinosaurs breathed it. The kids' eyes are very wide. They take deep gulps of air just to have more dinosaur air inside them. <laughs> the air we have is all the air we will ever have, Kate says. So we have to take good care of it. The kids gulp less. <laughs> Consider the air already inside. Kate tells more. Actually, she says, we're all cousins. <coughs> the kids look at each other, disbelieving, believing. You? <coughs> we, all of us, Kate says, way, way back began as cousins, way back in the beginning. The kids whoop, clap each other on the back. <laughs> For the rest of the day, they savor air and call each other cousin. Mm. So before I moved to Provincetown, when I lived on the North Shore, I was a member of the Universalist Church in Essex, Massachusetts. And it's a wonderful little church, very similar in spirit to the UU Meeting House here in town. One of the couples in Essex owned a whale watch company. And so at the church auction one year, I bid on and won tickets for a whale watch off of Cape Ann. Now, I had never actually been on a whale watch before, so I was very excited. I invited my family to come up for it, and it was a morning whale watch, so they pretty much had to get up at the crack of dawn to make it to Gloucester in time. 
It was cold that day, bitterly cold, and we were bundled up against the wind. My niece and nephew were excited at the start, and we all had our eyes on the horizon as we made our way out of the harbor. The tour guide showed us some props on the long ride out to sea to keep us entertained. She showed us what baleen looks like and taught us how the whales filter their food inside their mouths. As the hours progressed, though, we did not see a single whale. <laughs> well, I think there was one sighting way off in the distance, but I missed it. And it didn't get any warmer either. Truth be told, it was a pretty miserable trip. My family was not exactly happy with me. The tour guide on the boat felt so badly that she gave everyone rain check tickets so that we could go out another time to actually see some whales, but you really couldn't pay us to go back out. <laughs> now, a friend of mine went out on the very same whale watch boat the very next day, and she had a completely different experience. They saw tons of whales. <laughs> when she started telling me that they also ran into an entire school of dolphins, and that at one point hundreds of dolphins were jumping out of the water all around them and racing the boat, I had to stop that. <laughs> Life is just not fair sometimes. Luckily, I live here now, where you don't even have to go on a whale watch to see a whale. You can just go to Race Point and see them from the beach. But the whale watches are pretty spectacular too. How many of you have been whale watching or seen a whale from a beach? It's magical, isn't it? I have another question for you. How many of you have seen the movie Boyhood? A couple of people. Let me tell you about my favorite scene from that film. The boy, Mason, is staying over at his dad's house. They have a sort of every other weekend arrangement. But the dad's house is not set up for that, and so the boy and the dad are sleeping on two couches in the living room. It's nighttime and Mason is lying on the couch in the dark, trying to fall asleep. The dad is lying on the other couch, reading a book. Mason, who's probably about eight years old at this point, says, Dad, there's no, like, real magic in the world, right? What do you mean, the dad asks. You know, like elves and stuff. People just made that up. Well, says the dad, played by Ethan Hawke, I don't know, I mean, what makes you think that elves are any more magical than something like, like a whale? You know, I mean, what if I told you a story about how underneath the ocean there was this giant sea mammal that used sonar and sang songs. And it was so big that its heart was the size of a car and you could crawl through the arteries. I mean, you'd think that's pretty magical, right? Yeah, <laughs> says Mason after a minute. But like, right this second, there's like no elves in the world, right? <laughs> no, says the dad, although you can tell he doesn't want to. Technically, no elves. So we live in a world with technically no elves, but nevertheless a world filled with miraculous creatures, miraculous things that happen every day. I wonder if it's because we are so bitter or hardened or disappointed from learning that there are technically no elves that we often disregard the magic and mystery that is all around us. That's part of why I'm moved to talk about whales tonight, magical creatures. Whales are mammals, but they are fully adapted to aquatic life. You'll remember learning when you were about eight that being a mammal means that whale calves grow inside their mother until they are born, and then they are nursed, just like human babies. Whales are actually descendants of land-living animals which returned to the water after living millions of years on land. Whales 
breathe air. They use those blowholes on tops of their heads to breathe. So we're not just breathing in dinosaur air here. <laughs> we're breathing whale air. Let's take a moment to breathe deeply this whale air. <laughs> One of the most incredible things about whales, of course, is their sheer size. The blue whale is considered to be the largest animal in the world. In fact, it's the largest animal that ever existed, even bigger than the dinosaurs. It can weigh 420,000 pounds and measure 100 feet long. A blue whale's tongue alone can weigh as much as an elephant, and their hearts really do weigh as much as a car. And whales are communal creatures. They have relationships with each other and they value those relationships. They are extremely good parents. And whales even have best friends. <laughs> Based on a 16 year photographic study, scientists have learned that female humpback whales not only make friends with one another, they reunite each year. They remember their BFFs <laughs> and even find them across the ocean and among other whales. When a female humpback meets her friend, they simply float along together, eating and enjoying each other's company. And these friendships have quantifiable benefits. Female humpbacks who hang out in this way are healthier and give birth to more calves every year. Here's another crazy thing. In 2007, a dead bowhead whale was found to have something very strange embedded in its blubber. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be a weapon fragment that dated back to a patent filed in 1879. This suggests that the bowhead had survived a whaling attack from more than a hundred years ago. Scientists can't actually agree on the bowhead whale's maximum lifespan. Most die between the ages of 60 and 90, but amino acids in the eyes of bowhead whales suggest that the oldest ever discovered may have been up to 211 years old. <laughs> and even with all of our science, all of our explaining away magic with numbers and formulas, we are still being amazed by whales. Just last year, scientists figured out that a western gray whale had recently migrated 14,000 miles from Russia to Mexico and back. Did you hear about this? Um, it's the longest known migration of any creature, and it has totally blown away previous migration records this female western gray whale named Vavara, apparently that's Russian for Barbara, <laughs> swam all that way in just 172 days, 14,000 miles. They know this because they have been tagging whales with electronic monitoring tags and then tracking them using satellites. That's pretty amazing too. Another incredible thing is that it appears that Vavara did not stop to feed during her journey. She apparently ate enough food in Russia to tide her over for half a year. What? <laughs> it's incredible science like this that makes me think, hey, maybe Jonah really did get swallowed by a whale. Stranger things have happened. You remember that story from the Bible? Jonah was the reluctant prophet. He's the one that said no to God when God called upon him, who ran away when God told him to preach to Nineveh. He fled to Joppa, where he found a ship going to sea. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise! <laughs> 
call out to your God, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. When Jonah fessed up that he could not pray to his God to stop the storm, that he was actually running from God, and that God had probably caused the storm <laughs> to send him a message, the men didn't know what to do. Jonah told them to throw him into the sea so that the storm would cease, and they reluctantly did so. Some biblical scholars believe Jonah was trying to kill himself, but God had other plans and sent a great fish, a whale, to swallow Jonah and save him from the sea. <coughs> Jonah stays three days and nights in the belly of the whale before being delivered to dry land. This time, Jonah agrees to go to Nineveh and convinces the people there to repent from their wicked ways, and God spares them. A whale of a tail <laughs> from the Bible. <laughs> And what about that other famous whale story? It starts, call me Ishmael. <laughs> Ishmael and Queequeg board the Pequod, a whaling vessel from Nantucket, and go to sea with the mysterious Captain Ahab. The crew sets out on Christmas Day. When they finally see Ahab, they realize that he is bouncing on a false leg made from a sperm whale's jaw. He announces his intention to pursue and kill Moby Dick, the legendary great white whale who took his leg. He sees the whale as the embodiment of evil. They travel around Africa and into the Indian Ocean, hunting whales and processing them for oil, always asking each passing ship for information about the great white whale. On one ship, a crazed prophet predicts doom for anyone who threatens Moby Dick. A series of misadventures ensues. Finally, Ahab sights Moby Dick, and days of chase and destruction follow. On the third day, Moby Dick rams the Pequod and sinks it. Ahab is caught in a harpoon line and meets his death. The rest of the men are caught in the vortex created by the sinking ship and pulled under to their deaths. Only Ishmael, who was thrown from the boat at the beginning of the chase, is far enough away to escape the whirlpool, and he alone survives. Such stories. These symbolic whale narratives have captured the imagination of our culture and become iconic. Here's one more, a real whale tale. You might recognize it from a YouTube video that has gone viral the last several years. Michael Fishback, who's actually married to a friend of my family, spends two months on the Sea of Cortez every winter to photograph blue finback and humpback whales and to track them and observe their behavior in the wild. On Valentine's Day 2011, Michael and his family and a few friends were out on a small boat in the Sea of Cortez when they came upon a young humpback whale which appeared to be dead. They floated nearby for several minutes but didn't see any signs of life until the whale suddenly rose in the water and exhaled. They could tell something was wrong. Michael eased into the water with his snorkel gear to assess the situation. Swimming right up to the whale, he discovered that it was trapped in fishing netting. He tried to connect with the whale and communicate that he was not a threat. There were no words we could share, Michael remembers, but I wanted to let the whale know that we were there to help. The sight of this large and beautiful creature trapped and so close to death was almost overwhelming. And Michael freely admits that he was more than a little scared, knowing that the whale could easily kill him with one panicked movement. The situation was bleak. The tail was entangled in so much gear that it was weighted down a full 15 feet below the surface. Both pectoral fins were pinned to the side of its body, and the nylon gill went all the way up to the whale's back. The whale really was panicking. 
With his hands, Michael succeeded in getting the dorsal fin free, but that's all. He swam back to the boat to radio for help. He was told that perhaps in an hour, someone else would arrive, but by then they all knew it would be too late. After very little debate, everyone aboard the boat decided that they would stay and try to get the whale free of the netting. I can't really stress to you what a small boat this was and that our friends Michael and Heather had their very young son Galen aboard as well as friends but everyone wanted to save the whale so they worked to pull the net aboard the boat and they cut net as fast as they could using the one small knife they had after great effort they freed one of the pectoral fins then they paddled around to reposition themselves Sensing a little freedom though, the whale started to swim and proceeded to take them on a Nantucket sleigh ride through the Sea of Cortez. Eventually the whale tired and came back up beneath them. They continued to grab net and haul and cut until they freed the second pectoral fin. When the whale grew exhausted, they began cutting the net off of the powerful tail fluke. It was slow work and dangerous. Finally, about an hour after an hour of exhausting cutting and pulling, they made the final cut. She was free. On the video, you can see the whole boat exploding in celebration. We saved a humpback whale, Michael shouts. The whale slowly swims away, but in 500 feet, she breaches high into the air. All the way back, the whale shadows them, giving them the best whale watch they have <laughs> ever seen. For an hour, she provides them with an incredible surface display. Dozens and dozens of breaches, fin slaps, and tail slaps of celebration. My favorite part of the video is when young Galen says, Mommy, I know what she's doing. She's showing us she's free. <laughs> now, why am I telling you all of these whale tales? Why are whales a subject for worship? Well, I firmly believe that an important part of our spiritual life is simply to be in awe of creation. There is no higher form of worship. What if I told you a story about how underneath the ocean there was this giant sea mammal that used sonar and sang songs and it was so big that its heart was the size of a car and you could crawl through its arteries i mean you'd think that's pretty magical right, right. amen and blessings <laughs> to share with you this evening, not because it's one of my best pieces of writing, but because I wanted to talk for just a minute about my sources of inspiration when I write sermons. And that sermon is a great example of how, as a Unitarian Universalist minister, I'm able to draw on such a diverse number of sources for spiritual wisdom. The sermon I just shared drew from the Bible with the story of Jonah, but also science. I had so much fun researching whales when I wrote that. In my religious tradition, science and the natural world are just as worthy of quotation as ancient spiritual writings from all of the world's religious traditions. And I also drew upon literature and pop culture when I quoted from Moby Dick and the film Boyhood. And from YouTube, a great source of inspiration. And this time I just happened to know the people in the video. Nothing is left out when I consider what my spiritual and writing sources of inspiration can be. I keep a little notebook on me at all times. So if there is a story I hear on the radio or something I see that strikes me as beautiful or if I'm stopped in my tracks by a quote, I can write it down 
for use in future sermons. In fact, the other day when my niece Callie was sharing a story with my nephew John, he warned her, don't tell Aunt Kate, she'll put it in a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> my family and friends are often fodder for my writing, and my own personal life also shows up quite a bit. In his famous Divinity School address, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the true preacher can be known by this, that he deals out to people his life, life passed through the fire of thought. So that is what I try to do, pass life through the fire of thought and share it with others. I never preach a sermon that I don't need to hear myself, and I do my best never to shame anyone or scold anyone. Although I am preaching, I try not to make my writing too preachy. <laughs> In Divinity School, my preaching professor gave us this instruction, which I have always followed. When you are through writing your sermon, do a word search for the word you, and replace it every time with we. I guess an exception to that would be the phrase, thank you. <laughs> and so I thank you for coming out tonight and listening to my whale tales. <laughs> Have a Q and A question and an answer, and, and I know that uh, Reverend Kate Wilkinson is open to any questions you may have. Uh, I would start with um, uh, obviously, as a child, writing was very important to you. You galvanized the community, the <laughs> neighborhood, and you wrote poems and plays, and and you wrote in your your diary. Um, and then you went on to major in English and then work in a publishing company, as, as this is always in your program. And then you had a change. You had a, a, a change in your direction. Would you tell about, would you, if, if you don't mind, talk about how you went from working in a publishing company mm -hmm. to embracing Divinity School and then I think it's all connected, but um, maybe you could tell us your journey. Sure, sure. I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I spent a lot of time writing as a little girl, and I was a very shy little girl, but once you were my friend, I was going to make you be in one of my plays. So <laughs> I could be very bossy, um, and I had a great deal of fun with that growing up. And I always wanted to be a writer for my work as my job. And so out of college, I started working at a publishing company in Boston. But very few people at a publishing company have a creative job. The other 90% are sort of paper pushing. <laughs> at least that was my experience. And so I was frustrated by not having a lot of creative license in that job. So I was looking for what to do next, since publishing wasn't really the dream I thought it would be. And so I was thinking of my other interests in life, other than writing, and I really was committed to social justice, and I loved listening to people. Both my parents were therapists. I liked creating spiritual spaces, and I still liked writing, and all of those come together in ministry. And I was attending a church at the time, and the minister, who I didn't know very well at all, came up to me and put her arm around me and said, when are you going to come and talk to me about becoming a minister? <laughs> and I just thought she had like seen into my soul somehow. Uh, and so she convinced me to go to divinity school earlier than later. And so that was uh, what I chose. And it's true, all of those things, all of those things I was passionate about are part of my week every week here. So appreciative of that. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? Or I'd like to add to your vocabulary of whales. Have you ever heard the expression blowing bubbles? If you look it up, it refers to the way whales communicate as a group. And when they're out swimming, they swim in a circle. And in that circle, they blow bubbles. And the bubbles create a net. And the net captures the small fish that they eat. That's great. And wow. during Art Week, a lot of us paint all kinds of pictures about whales. And I have 
several paintings called Blown Bubbles. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Well, never cease to amazing. Always learning something new. That's great. Tar? Yeah, I just have a question, not so much about writing. I'm curious if that's okay. It's like a quite a Kate personal question. Like your family, what? What's your ancestry in terms of religion, in terms of? Um, well, I grew up Unitarian Universalist from about the age of eight. And um, my family before that uh, was Episcopal. And my mother is a singer. And she actually just got a job at the Unitarian Universalist Church in my hometown as a paid soloist in the choir. So you really can preach to the choir and make a difference <laughs> because uh, my mom became UU and started bringing me to church. And um, my sister and my dad never went. It was always a choice, but I loved it. And I would, you know, if I didn't want to go early with my mom, I would get my own ride and I would uh, go on my own. But so Unitarian Universalism is a recent development in my family. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I enjoyed your writing so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it made me feel good, which is why I came because I saw that you were speaking and I had once heard you and it was like, she makes me feel good. You said you, you created spiritual spaces as a young person. I was just curious what that was and what it means to you. Yeah. Well, it's really funny to think about now because I realized that I was taking in things about all the world religions from a very young age and sort of with a very surface level understanding of it, trying to incorporate it into my spiritual life. I think children are extremely spiritual people, and we don't always give them the outlet for that. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was little, in my room, I had a little um, chest that my grandfather had made for me, and it had a heart on it, and it just meant a lot for me. And I created my own little altar there, and I would I don't think my parents knew, light candles. <laughs> and I would arrange stones and crystals and things that seemed special to me. And I had seen my friend's mom, who was Buddhist, use prayer beads for praying. And I had seen her put them sort of on her fingers. So I had these two crystal keychains that I would put on my fingers. And I didn't know about prayers, but I had this birthday card that had a poem on it. And I would read that. And it was my little chant mantra prayer. And I would just spend a little time on my own in my room arranging things and doing the prayer and lighting the candles. And it just made me feel really peaceful and centered. And I think that kids and adults crave that. Um, but we don't always tell kids how they can create it for themselves. And so I was just seeking that out in all the ways that a little girl knew how to. So. But when I was older, mm -hmm. that was, um, came in different forms. Like I formed a young adult group at my church and we would do circle worship, which was different than your Sunday morning worship where everyone faced the minister. It was all done in a circle. There was a lot of personal sharing and a lot of music and it was more um, interactive. And, and then they so had to perform in your place? Yeah, yeah. I stayed bossy. I still like to say, like, come on guys, let's do this. And luckily my congregation is so willing to go along with these crazy ideas. The other day um, I preached about rage and about Augustitis, about the town just being tense and on each other's last nerves at the end of the tourist season. And then I invited them to um, go out onto our lawn after the service under a tent and offer singing blessings to people walking by. Uh -huh. So we did that for an hour, and anyone who would come and sit, we sang to, and the sound stays under the tent and sort of bathes the person in the middle in song, and it was really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. It was great, and yeah. I think we had about 20 singers, and I don't know how many people stopped, but um, that was really fun. So I appreciate a congregation that will go along with these crazy ideas. <laughs> anyone else? <laughs> Crazy. Yes. Hi. Uh, I enjoyed your story so much. I'm wondering if the impact of being in Provincetown near the sea has any uh, impact on your spiritual journey here mm. and stuff like that. Definitely. I think that standing by the ocean is the most healing place for me. And 
part of that I think is scale. So <laughs> you can feel when you're on the mainland or away from the ocean that your life is the center and your problems are huge and how can you wrestle with them? But if you stand by the ocean, you're this big and it's <laughs> this big and it puts everything into perspective and so it's a really healing and also the timelessness of it and the and so many messages about the tides and um, biding your time and having you know ebb and flow and high tide and low tide and uh, I learned so much from the ocean and I grew up in Plymouth not too far from here and the ocean has always been an important part of my life so when I was looking for churches that was like on the top of my list <laughs> something near the ocean Good Thank you. Yeah. anyone else well thank you very thank much you. Thank you.